Hey everyone, today I'm going to be talking about VOR navigation in Flight Sim 2020. Although many VORs are being retired in the coming years and navigation is very slowly moving to entirely GPS-based navigation, it's still an important skill to at least understand the basics for a few different reasons. First of all, if you're flying an airplane without a GPS like the steam gauge Cessna 152 or Cessna 172, you won't have much of a choice but to use them for navigation if you become completely lost. Secondly, the main reason I'm talking about this today is it's information you're going to need if you want to follow along the IFR series that I'm doing. When you're flying in IFR conditions, you're changing radio frequencies a lot more frequently, especially to keep track of where you are along a departure or approach or localizer. So you really want to be familiar with how those work beforehand. In the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to give you a quick overview of how VORs work, when you would actually use them, and I'm going to spend most of the time explaining how to navigate with them while flying in Microsoft Flight Simulator. The flight I'm going to be using to explain to you how VORs work is from Friday Harbor down to Olympia Regional Airport. As usual, I choose the from and to airports at the top, and automatically the game gave me a direct heading from one airport to the other. Since we're going to be doing VOR navigation though, I can actually change this to the VOR to VOR setting. You can see that what it did is it added this VOR to the middle of my flight path, which happens to be at Olympia Regional Airport. We'll be able to capture the signal from this VOR from Friday Harbor, but it's not super realistic in the way that it does it. I'm going to show you how to tweak the flight path a little bit to make it just that wee bit more realistic. You can see VORs on the flight planning screen. If you go into more and then you go into the filters and you turn on navades. Once you've done that, if you start zooming in, you're going to be able to see not only airports, but you're also going to see other things like this one right here, which is the Penco VOR. It's really not easy to see them in the game though, and once you zoom out a little bit, you really can't tell if it's a VOR or if it's another airport or what is it. For that reason, if I am planning a flight that's going to be VOR to VOR, this is one of those occasions where I'll actually get out of the game to do a little bit of planning in Sky Vector. I'm gonna pop over there now to show you a little bit more of what I mean. So once I went on to Sky Vector, the first thing I did is I put in my departure and destination airports exactly like in Flight Sim. That gave me the exact same direct flight path from Friday Harbor down to Olympia Regional. The other thing that I did is I toggled it onto World Low. By default, it's set to World VFR, but I find World Low to be a lot easier to read. You can more easily see where the VORs are, and you can also see where the different airways are. In this case, I can see there's one VOR down at Olympia Regional and there's another one at Penn Cove right near Friday Harbor. And what you'll notice is between the two VORs, there is a line right here that goes from one VOR to the other. That's called a Victor Airway and it makes it a lot easier to fly from one VOR to the other because it's going to tell you what radial you should fly and it's going to give you some information as well about different altitudes. So to add Pen Cove to my flight pad, all I've got to do is drag this line right here onto the Pen Cove VOR and then I can just add it to my flight plan. So now we can see that my flight path goes from Friday Harbor over to Pen Cove and then I follow the V165 Victor Airway all the way down to Olympia Regional. All VORs are antennas on the ground and they transmit two signals that the airplane's navigation systems can interpret and figure out if they're flying to or from the station and on what radial they're flying. A VOR has 360 radials emitting out of it, one for each heading from 1 to 360. You fly to or from a VOR on a given radial. What I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to take off from the airport, I'm going to figure out what radial I'm on and I'm going to fly directly to the Penco VOR. Once I get to the Penco VOR, I'm going to then fly the 165 radial all the way down to Olympia Regional. And like I was saying, the airway is called V165 because it's on the 165 radial from Penn Cove. And you can see that that 165 matches up pretty much with the heading between the two VORs. And like I was saying, the airway is called V165 because it's on the 165 radial from Penn Cove. And you can see that that 165 matches up pretty much with the heading between the two VORs. You can see in both places where it says V165 that there are numbers above it. That's telling you different altitudes that you need to be aware of. 6000 is the minimum altitude that you should be flying at. 
but 5,000 is actually the MOCA or minimum obstacle clearance altitude. You definitely want to be above that one because if you're not, you're going to end up crashing into a mountain. You can see in both places where it says V165 that there are numbers above it. That's telling you different altitudes that you need to be aware of. 6,000 is the minimum altitude that you should be flying at, but 5,000 is actually the MOCA or minimum obstacle clearance altitude. You definitely want to be above that one because if you're not, you're going to end up crashing into a mountain. Where two radials of two different VORs meet is something called an intersection, and you can see one right here. Those are natural points where you might want to consider swapping from one frequency to the other. It's going to depend obviously on the strength of the VOR and if you're still capturing a signal, you might want to switch over earlier, but oftentimes I'll end up switching at an intersection point. All right, I'm going to pop back over to Flight Sim now and I will plot this in the flight planning screen. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this VOR that it added when I chose the VOR to VOR setting. To do that, I just clicked on the waypoint and I click remove. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the Penco VR. I do know it's right here. And I'm going to click add. There we go. Now my flight path is going to be exactly like I had in Sky Vector, and I'll be able to fly my flight exactly how I plotted it. One neat thing that I did notice, if you do zoom in all the way on the flight planning screen, you can actually see the VORs right here below the flight path line. It's a little bit to the left of where the actual waypoint is placed on the map, but it's definitely our VOR right there. All right, that's enough flight planning for today, so let's get into the cockpit. All right, so before takeoff, I'm going to configure my nav radio so that once I'm airborne, it's going to be easy for me to intercept the VOR. I use the knobs on the left hand side. The outer knob changes the larger number and the inner knob changes the smaller number after the dot. I'm looking for the Penco VOR which is on 117.2 and once I've set it I'm going to press the double sided arrow which is going to swap the frequencies for me. You can see I'm already picking up the signal of the VOR because it's showing its identifier which is CVV. Sometimes you'll be able to receive the signal to the VOR while you're on the ground, but other times you won't be able to. Next, I've got to change the navigation mode by hitting the CDI button until it displays VOR1 inside of the compass. I'm going to want to fly the 165 radial from the VOR, so I'm actually going to set that right now, and I'm going to try and intercept the radial before I get to the VOR station. I use the course knob to change the course that's set and you can see the number changing just to the right above the compass. And as I move through, you're going to see the needle is going to go from fully deflected to the right to fully deflected to the left. So it's going to tell me where I am relative to the station at the moment. You can see now it's settled down and it's fully deflected to the left, which means when I get in the air, I'm going to have to turn left to intercept the radial. Lastly, to prepare the navigation system, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the PFD and I'm going to turn on DME, which is going to show that little section in the bottom left there. It's going to tell me the NAV1 frequency that I'm configured to and the distance to NAV1, which in this case is 20.7 nautical miles. I'm also going to enable the wind setting because it's going to allow me to be able to have a better idea of how much I need to compensate for the wind that's blowing me either left or right off course. Actually, while I'm at it, I'm also going to tune the Olympia VOR frequency into the NAV1 standby frequency. It's a little bit easier to do on the ground because the plane's not bouncing around and it's easier to handle the different knobs. I'm also going to set it into my NAV2 active frequency by pressing on the actual NAV button to swap to NAV2 and then change the frequency to the exact same frequency of 113.4. But in this case, I'm actually going to make it the active frequency because I want to be able to know once I'm actually picking up the station. You can see now I'm not actually picking it up, probably because it's a little bit too far or if there's a mountain in the way, obviously I wouldn't be able to pick up the signal. I'm also going to sync my heading bug by pressing the HDG button on the autopilot console. That's going to make it a little bit easier once I'm airborne and I want to enable the autopilot so that I can let it do some of the flying and I can focus on just the navigational aspects. I'm also going to set my target cruise altitude, which in this case I believe is 8,000 feet. And then I'll be all set once I turn on the autopilot. It's really going to just fly the plane for me. 
with all of that said, it is time for takeoff and I'll probably just skip forward a little bit in the video because there's nothing really to show you during the takeoff. The interesting bits happen once I'm airborne. Alright, I'm just completing my takeoff now and I'm going to set myself up for my climb to my cruise altitude. So if I were flying this normally, I would turn to a heading of 165, which is the radial that I want to fly to the station. In this case, I'm already pretty close at 158, so I won't do that. But you can see that the needle's fully deflected to the left, which means that my course that I want to fly to the station is somewhere to the left of me. So to do that, what I'm actually going to do is I am going to turn to a heading of around 120, which is around 40 degrees off the course I want to fly, to try and intercept the radial as soon as I can. The VOR is really not far at the moment, it's less than 20 nautical miles, so I need a very steep angle of intercept, otherwise I'll probably not intercept the 165 radial before I get to the station. Normally though, you could use anywhere between 30 and 45 degrees to intercept the radial. As for which course you're currently flying, you can see that in the compass with that giant arrow at the top. It's pointing to the actual course that you're trying to fly to or from the station. You can also see that number in the little box right above it where it says course 165. That's a very precise number that tells you exactly what radial you're trying to fly. The station itself though doesn't know which direction you're flying. The navigation system does and it's going to tell you which way the station is with the second little arrow that you can see just behind the bigger arrow. If I were flying from the station, that little arrow would actually be on the other side instead of where it is right now, and we'll see that once we go past the VOR. You can also see how far off course you are and make adjustments accordingly. You can see the airplanes right at the center of your compass there, and there are two dots on either side of the airplane. Those little dots indicate 5 degrees and 10 degrees respectively. So if the needle is all the way deflected like it is right now on that 10 degree notch, that means that the course is 10 degrees or more to the left of me. Getting on course is pretty easy. If the needle is to the left, you want to turn left, and if the needle is to the right, you want to turn right. You can get into some funky situations where the needle is going to be working in the opposite direction, but I won't look at that right now. Always just make sure that your course is set either to or from the station, and the rest will take care of itself. You can see the needle is starting to move in towards the center now, so I'm actually going to shallow up my heading so that I'm a little bit closer to the 165 course that I want to intercept. When it starts moving, it starts moving quickly, so you really got to be watching it and be on top of it. So you can see now it, I'm less than 5 degrees off course, so I'm going to keep changing my heading and get just that ever little bit closer to 165. You can see on the GPS on the right that I'm actually getting really close to the station and the closer I am, the harder it becomes to be able to get on the course because the needle is just going to become a lot more sensitive since you're a lot closer to the station. Instead of chasing the needle, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set myself to heading 165 right now and I'm going to try and hold that until I've gone past the VOR. You can see the needle now starts to move to the right because it thinks I'm a little bit to the right off course, and I probably am, but because I'm so close to the VOR station, it's practically impossible to tune it properly. It's really best to just let it go, and then once I've gone past the station, I can wait for it to settle back down and readjust as needed. The other thing you'll notice is that as I get over the VOR, which is going to happen any second now as the needle becomes fully deflected, is that we're actually going to completely lose the needle, and that's because I'm going to lose the signal to the VOR. That should only last a couple of seconds as I'm exactly over the station. So there we go, now it's disappeared, and in a couple of seconds it should reappear, there we go. The needle, which means the course is still somewhere to the right, but you can see that the little arrow is now, instead of being just below the big arrow, is completely opposite of the big arrow, which means we're flying from the station. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make very small adjustments to my heading to be able to get on course. So because the heading is to the right, I'm going to turn just a little bit more to the right and let that needle come in and center itself. I really don't need to make very big adjustments when I'm less than 5 degrees off course. I really just do a couple of degrees change, 
let it come in and then I ever so slowly move it back until I am directly on course. Now I've been doing this entirely manually by using the heading mode and adjusting my heading accordingly to intercept the VOR. If you want to make things a little bit easier, all you've got to do is press the nav button and by doing that, what's going to happen is the computer is actually going to use what you've set in the VOR1 frequency and it's going to look at the course you want to fly and it's going to adjust itself accordingly. In this case, because I enabled nav mode and I was already on the 165 radial, there really wasn't much of a change to do at all. It ended up changing course just very slightly to get precisely right on top of that V165 radial that I want to fly. At this point, I'm settled onto the Victor Airway that's going to take me all the way to the Olympia VOR, but the last thing to do is to actually switch over to tracking that VOR instead of the Cove Harbor one. The natural swapping point like we saw in the flight panning section was to do it when I was 25 DME out from Olympia. And that's because that's where there's an intersection and where it's a natural switching point from one station to the other. That being said, I'm already picking up the station and I know that because on my NAV2 I can now see OLM which is the identifier for the Olympia VOR and it's telling me that it's definitely seeing it now. So if I wanted to swap over onto NAV1 onto Olympia, I could do it now as well if I really wanted to. When you swap the frequencies, it seems like the autopilot automatically turns off the navigation mode. I guess because it wants you to confirm that you still want to fly with the nav mode. So all you've got to do is just re-click the button and the airplane will take over once again. At this point, the autopilot's in control and it's going to handle intercepting the course properly by turning to the right since the needle is slightly deflected to the right as well. I hope this video helps with the very basics of VOR navigation. There are a ton more details that I could have gone over in this video, but I really want it to be an introductory level to VOR navigation, so I'll probably do a follow-up at some point in the future. As usual, if you got some value out of this video, please make sure to hit like and subscribe, and if you have any comments, feel free to put them in the comment section below.